really we work very closely with a whole range of different partners to better understand how to serve the global community in the way that it designs and pays for and implements and uses digital health tools and technologies. So we work with donors, we work with innovators like yourselves really to look at advancing those digital health tools that are out there and we work with governments and technology experts based in country, particularly in low and middle income countries to strengthen those country-led implementations. And why do we do this? Well, of course, we, I think we're all here because ultimately we're looking to improve health outcomes and to really advance health equity. And we strongly believe that digital health is an essential component to do that. Um, next slide, please, Maria. So, how did this all come about? So in the early days when there was a lot of enthusiasm for digital technologies and the promise for how they could really transform the way that health services are delivered, um, there, there were a great many projects, a great many pilots, many, many stakeholders um, and people involved. And while there were a lot of successes, there were also a lot of issues that came out of that period. So a lot of fragmentation, a lot of competing priorities, siloed data systems, and also a lot of additional burden on an already stressed health system. So really the, the idea and the concept of global goods was really in response to this issue. Uh, next slide. So this is really where the Digital Health, uh, Digital Square initiative came about which was really to try and address this problem and create a marketplace for digital health tools. So really finding a way where we could support those leaders and the decision makers with the type of resources that they would need for digital transformation in health. And we really do that in three different ways. So as I mentioned, one is really through looking at alignment with donors and also opportunities for co-investment one of which is also supporting regional institutions and bodies and also country governments and specialists and in-country implementers, both to sort of better understand the needs within countries and to support their digital health initiatives and their project implementations. And then of course, the, the third area is around the advocacy and promotion of global goods. So global goods in the sense that these are well-designed, well-built, well-produced digital health resources that will advance this work. Next slide. Okay, so we do this in a number of ways. And one of which is the open application process that we're discussing today. Uh, really something that is intended to foster transparency. Um, it's also we hope that it allows for collaboration with like-minded partners. And it is something that we, we really aim for it to be as easy and as quick as possible. So we're always, always looking for ways to actually improve that process. Um, our team also provides technical oversight on those sub-awards that are given to global good innovators. Um, so between us, we have uh, very many years of experience are coming from a whole range of different sectors within that global digital health sector. Um, we also serve as a convener of the global goods community, um, connecting everyone to each other and also to those country projects. Uh, one of the ways in which we do that is by hosting an annual global goods innovator summit. So our latest one was a couple of weeks ago in Tanzania. Um, where we had over 140 participants, um, including a very wide representation from some of our existing global goods partners. Um, we also advise on standards development um, and just generally supporting the technical ecosystem. Um, we have uh, some members who have um, very strong expertise, uh, particularly around data exchange standards. And um, we also work with the World Health Organization and with others to streamline both the approval, but also the use of 
Digital Public Goods for Health. Uh, next slide. So just to call out um, a couple of examples of where we've been doing that most recently. So some of the ways in which Digital, Digital Square has been supporting this is through the SMART Guidelines Digital Adaptation Kit for Antenatal Care, um, both in developing those guidelines and then through providing some support for um, the in initial use and adaptation of those kits. Uh, our team was also involved in providing technical guidance for the DDCC, the Digital Documentation for COVID-19 Certificates. And we've also been looking to strengthen our existing global good tools to be really more easily implementable, um, a concept that we talk about as shelf readiness. And our prior notice to this, Notice F, was focused very much on that. So for example, one of the things that we supported was um, the um, inclusion of a quality assurance testing framework in one of the tools and also the development of capacity building, a capacity building program with associated materials as well. Um, and as I say, the, the use of standards and interoperability profiles is a core piece also of what we do and what we advocate for. Next slide. Okay, so when we talk about Digital Square Global Goods, this is what we mean. They are tools that are either open source if they are software tools. For services, they have no barrier for access. And for content tools that they're actually available under some form of open license. Also that they need to be supported by either an anchor organization or a very strong community with clear governance structures. They need to have been deployed at some sort of scale. And, and we know that this is a difficult thing to define, but really what this is intended to show is, is a, a degree of maturity and a, a degree of use at scale, um, ideally across multiple countries. We would also like to see demonstrated effectiveness of the use of these tools. And um, you know, they're either designed to be interoperable or to support interoperability in some way. Um, the other aspect that's really important is sustainability. Um, again, this is we know this is a difficult area, but looking at um, plans or means to ensure the, the longer term sustainability for these digital health tools. One of the questions we are asked fairly often is around the relationship to DPGs, the digital public goods. And we do have a very close relationship to those. So we work with the Digital Public Good Alliance. Um, and global goods and DPGs do overlap in very many aspects, um, particularly around the DPG standard. But there are also some differences. And the global goods are really seen as um, things that are primarily health focused. So whereas the DPGs are much broader and, and also look at things, for example, across education or agriculture and so on. Um, but we also have a number of um, indicators that, that really speak again to the maturity of the tool. And so in short, probably the easiest way to remember this is that all digital square, square global goods are DPGs, but not all DPGs are global goods. Right, next slide, please. We have three different types of global goods, um, software tools, and um, certainly to date, much of our focus has, has really been around supporting the software applications. Um, but we also do have a category of services. And while we're here today, the content global goods. So our definition of a content global good is any sort of resource or toolkit or standard that is available under an open license and is used to either improve or analyze those capabilities needed for managing health data. And, and that's very broad. I mean, those capabilities could be anything from resource allocation to hardware, software, uh, physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, 
operations and of course the, the people and the skills that they need. Next slide, please. Uh, this is really just to show you the reach of our global goods. So they, they really are global and sort of very widely represented. Next slide, please. And then our content global goods really need to be classified under one of the phases of the DIG, the Digital Implementation Investment Guide. So really looking at those seven core phases that really cover any form of digital health intervention from the early landscaping phase right through to use at scale. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have maturity models and this is our primary tool for evaluating our global goods. Um, we used to just have one, um, which has evolved into being the software specific maturity model now in its fourth iteration. Um, but we recently have developed one specifically for content, which is the one um, that is used for G1. Um, these really serve as a guide, um, both for people developing, creating or curating content um, to look at areas where they might want to strengthen um, particular areas or where, where there are gaps, but also for investors to understand where there might be areas um, where, which they could support through investment. And this is really our baseline that is used during this process um, of you know, understanding what it takes to become a global good. Um, just to note also that this is something that has been developed with a great deal of input from members of the community wo worldwide. Um, in particular, we've been working through the Digital Health and Interoperability Working Group, um, part of the Health Data Collaborative, um, in the development of all of our models. Um, we are also hoping to be producing one specifically for services uh, later on this year. Next slide, please. Okay, we have a global goods guidebook, one of our sort of primary assets. And really what this is, is a showcase of all our approved global goods. And this is in its fourth iteration. The latest version was published in May of this year. So that's available on our website um, for download. Um, what this is, is, is really, it provides a whole lot of information and guidelines to anyone who's really looking to implement or find solutions for their digital health problems and um, really sort of aiming to provide an ecosystem of choice for those countries who are looking to implement something. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and the one thing that we are particularly excited about actually is our new interactive global goods guidebook. So this will be launched in the third quarter of 2023. And what you can see there is our, our latest mock-up for what it's going to look like. Um, this is going to be an online interactive website. So it will contain all of the same information that's available in the printed version. Um, but we hope this to really will become a living resource um, that we will be able to extend. And that will prove a very valuable tool for, again, anyone looking for solutions or potential solutions, um, or sort of understanding what are the type of resources available to them to support health implementations. Next slide. Okay, so now we come to G1, um, the expression of interest. So all of our notice G calls are focused on identifying global goods. So both um, refreshing those that are already existing and known as global goods, but particularly identifying new ones. So this G1 is actually the second phase under the first phase in G0, uh, which was the last quarter of 2022, we refreshed our global goods for software. Um, so those are the, the 36 tools that are featured in our version four of the guidebook, um, which includes many of the familiar names uh, and also some new tools. So under G1, as I mentioned before, this is the first call that we've 
we've had that is purely focused on the identification of content global goods. Um, and this is really you know, something that has been driven by requests from countries and, and from the partners that we work with. Next slide. Okay, so all of this happens through our open application process platform. Um, next slide. And this is what we're looking for. So anything that um, is approved as a content global good really needs to firstly meet the definition of a global good. So just to reiterate for content, we're talking about a resource toolkit, data standard, openly available and used to improve capabilities around health data. So it must be available under an appropriate Creative Commons license or something similar. It must be registered as a DPG with the Digital Public Good Alliance. It must focus on SDG3 health and well-being, and it also needs to be mapped to show where it is relevant um, across any of those seven phases uh, within the Digital Implementation Investment Guide. And it must provide evidence of uptake at scale and some degree of maturity. Again, along with support from a community or an anchor organization. So really, you know, someone who cares about this and is interested in the long-term sustainability of the good. Next slide. Okay, so the benefits. So first off, this particular expression of interest um, is focused on identification. So there is no funding actually associated with this. But what successful candidates will get is, first of all, recognized and attributed as a Digital Square approved global good. So a brand really that has strong recognition within the digital health community as a, a trusted resource. Um, you will become a member of the global goods community um, and have access to Digital Square's basket of services. So that would include things like access to our free webinars, uh, things like our fire webinars and the, the other range of webinars that we host. Uh, our digital square basket of services is something that we're also um, developing and will be uh, speaking about in due course, but that will include things, for example, um, like a security framework and recommendations um, to enhance cybersecurity. So that's something that will be coming soon. And of course, as mentioned, you will be featured in the Global Goods Guidebook, both the print and the interactive version. Next slide, please. Right, so what do we need from you? This is the type of information that we're looking for. So first of all, it's answering a set of questions. And with that, we also would like you to provide links and as, as much evidence really as you can to substantiate um, the, the answers that you're given and the ratings that you provide in the maturity model. So, you know, th things like links to um, published training materials or, um, you know, links to a, a content roadmap, for example. Um, and then the, the second piece is to actually complete the maturity model. Um, so that uh, has, three different categories and a range of different sub-indicators. Um, it's a simple self-assessment tool and you rate yourself as low, medium or high according to the descriptions that have been provided in terms of where you, where you see yourself um, in terms of maturity. And uh, all of that is actually embedded within the application platform, which Maria is going to show you shortly. Um, next slide, please. Okay, they are evaluated according to the criteria. So we have firstly meeting that definition of a global good and being a digital public good. And then secondly, around the maturity of the tool. So that um, image that you can see on the side there is uh, taken from our, um, the tool that we, the, our peer review committee actually uses as part of the evaluation process. And you can see that it, it's very clearly mapped to both the maturity model and the questions that are answered. 
Um, so the peer review committee, which is made up of a number of different um, highly specialized people within the broader community, they review the applications in accordance with all of these, and they provide recommendations as to what should be adopted. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so just a reminder, um, we are hopefully going to be able to answer a lot of your questions today. But if you do have further questions, any of those questions need to be submitted by end of day this Friday, June 30th. And we will respond to any of those with published responses by next week. So that's July the 5th. And then the final application deadline is two weeks from today. So end of day, July the 12th, 2023. Okay, I think that was it. I think it is time to hand over to Maria, who is our Wise Hive guru, and will talk you through the step-by-step -step process. Thank you so much, Linda, for all the information in the background there. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. So if you did apply for Notice G1 or any other notice in the past year or so, this will look quite familiar to you. Um, I won't spend a huge amount of time on all of the details here as I think it's relatively simple, but please do ask any questions to clarify what might not be super clear from my uh, explanation. So on the OIP website, which is the older website, which probably looks very familiar to a lot of you, um, you can find the full PDF of this expression of interest. And on the right-hand side, the right-hand menu is uh, the link to the application portal to apply. It takes you here where you can either log in if you've used this platform in the past year or so, all of your login information will be saved, or you can create a new account. And then once you do that, you need to create a profile. So even if you did log in um, using a previous login from Notice G0 or, or Bayer EOI, whatever it might be, um, you need a new profile for each application. So please make sure that you no, you can't move forward until you complete your profile. Just four simple questions, name, email, organization, and title. Uh, another note here though, please make sure that the name and email is going to a person as we do use the portal, the platform to send out email reminders. So we want it to go to a monitored inbox so that you are receiving all the information that we're sending out throughout the process. After you've completed your profile, you can press the nice little plus button to get started, which takes you to your main application screen. So there are two forms. There's the content global goods form and the maturity model form. Um, you can open it on the right hand side, the blue little open button. Um, another note here, please make sure that you are completing your forms completely like all the way through and to the best of your ability before hitting submit, because once you do, they are no longer able to be edited. So um, once you are opening these, uh, excuse me, sorry. Oh, sorry, <laughs> dusty around here. I've had, I've had allergies for weeks. Anyway, um, once you open up your content global goods application, you'll go through and answer all of these questions. Um, just about every single one is required. So uh, you'll get um, an error code if you don't complete what is required. You can save as a draft at any time and come back to it, log back in, pick up where you left off. And even once you mark complete, it still is technically editable until you hit submit on the main screen. So you will be able to save your drafts. You'll be able to edit until the main screen comes back. Uh, and this application is quite self-explanatory. It goes through the questions that Linda showed you, the, um, the, the standard like background information and the details about your uh, content. For the maturity model, the form looks a tiny bit different on this screen. You have to go over and click add new item which will take you to the maturity model. There's going to be a descriptor of how to use the form. And we also have the table form linked in this description. So if you wanna see it in that way and how we use that scoring, um, please feel free to click that link. It'll take you to a Google sheet that's open viewing. Once you are going through your maturity model, it maps roughly this way. So the left-hand side is our core indicator. And that's what is represented here, the heading. Subheading is the sub indicator, so country utilization for this example. These are the descriptions of a low, medium, or high maturity, 
And then here is where you will indicate your content's maturity as it relates to that sub indicator and indicator. Um, it's pretty simple because it's laid out like this way, but this is how it maps to the table version of the maturity model if you prefer to look at it in that context. So once you've completed everything, you can go ahead and hit submit and you'll get a confirmation screen. Make sure that you hit submit, otherwise it does not go through as um, no longer being a draft. And that's pretty much it. I know I sped through a little bit, but please feel free to ask any questions. Um, these are our email addresses. If you want to make a note of them, my email address is scattered all throughout the platform for any issues you may have. Um, and Linda's is also in the, um, the PDF version of the call for interest. But I will open up to questions. Uh, you are totally welcome to come off of mute, put it into the chat. I do see one from Grace, which is if you think the WHO SMART guidelines will become a content global good as part of this mechanism. And I will give that over to you, Linda. Um, yeah, thanks, Grace. So uh, I think the, the short answer is yes, we do believe that. Um, we, we do think that it meets many of the criteria to actually be something that is you know, reusable, um, ad adaptable, and of value. Um, so, yes, uh, th that is something that we think will happen. Th does that to answer all your questions, Grace? Is there any, any <laughs> other yes. comments that you have? Perfect. Thank you. Over. Okay. And I, I see the next one in the chat there from Talia. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. But, I, yeah, I think this is probably going to be a common question. Um, if you're not yet classified as a DPG, can you apply anyhow or should you apply for DPG first? So what I would say pragmatically on this note is um, apply for both. Um, we, we really do want to um, try and identify as many new content global goods you know, as is feasible. And um, for two reasons, um, we, we do know that there might be a few issues around applying for DPG status. Um, previously, um, DPG had a, um, uh, I forget the, the term, but basically it was, you, you know, you'd applied but not yet heard um, as to whether or not you'd been approved. And, and that was acceptable for the Digital Square Global Good. Um, but they have recently actually done away with that category. So now you're, you're either registered or you're not. Um, and so, you know, our, our um, approval processes are not necessarily aligned in terms of the, the timelines. So I would say, please just apply for both um, and just provide the link um, or the, the reference um, to kind of show that you have actually um, attempted to register as a DPG. The other caveat as well is that we know that the DPGA is currently revising the way that they are um, evaluating global standards. Um, so if it is a global standard, that's something where we've sort of already agreed to, to waive that requirement um, because it's something that they're, they're reconsidering at the moment. Can I just add one thing there, Linda? Sure. Um, for the software global goods, we did have some people who applied for their DPG approval and they did send us the confirmation email that they had submitted the application. So in their application, they submitted the nomination link, but they also emailed us that. So I feel that would be a fine way to go about it since I, as you said, I don't believe that they're doing nomination links anymore. Great, yeah, thanks Maria. And that was the word I was trying to remember was nomination. Okay, so um, next question I think is from Gerda. Can we submit for a content and software global good at the same time? Um, so the current call for G1 is purely for content. And um, so that's what we're looking for this time around. Um, just to note that what we are hoping to do going forward is to change our, our process slightly so that it is more of a continuous process. Um, because we know that, you know, when these notices come out, it's, it's um, you know, they're at specific time intervals, um, which might also not sort of really line up with, um, you know, what uh, organizations are 
looking to do. So um, we're, we're hoping to do that, but that um, is something that's still in the pipeline. Um, so for now, um, this is just a call for content global goods. Okay, let's see. Okay, the maturity model assessment tool does not allow for any explanations. Um, that's a good point, actually, because yes, you are correct. And we, we used to use a, a Google spreadsheet that did allow you to um, justify why you'd gone for a particular rating. Um, it would indeed be helpful to have comments on the maturity indicators. What I would suggest um, you do at the moment, because I know that our tool is not, um, the model is not set up to do that, but any justification or additional comments, could you please add that in terms of the questions that you're answering? Um, does that make sense, Andrew? Um, oh, I see in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, 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 the standard part of the application. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sounds fine. Thanks, but but um, they don't. Thank own, you. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship, I think, between them. But certainly could have them there. Yeah. Just, just it. Yeah. Anything else? If it's important for us to know, um, just, just pop it in there. And and thanks for that feedback because actually that's something we'll probably consider next time around. Because um, I know we we used to have that and and we don't anymore. Okay, so uh, Jeff, our, ours is already in the guidebook as software global good. Can we apply again to be included as content? Um, uh, I would say yes. Um, there are obviously some specific criteria related to, related to the content, um, but yes, absolutely, we would consider that as well. Okay, just looking at the next one. Um, is content all related to capabilities to manage health data? Sorry, I'm just, just reading that. So you create open source material for health workers. So content on managing childhood illnesses, vaccination. Yes, I, I would say reading your description there. Uh, yes, very definitely. I think that would still be considered as a, a global good for health. Yeah, I, I hope that answered your question. But yes, that that definitely looks um, it more than meets the criteria for a, a content global good. Thank you. Um, I think that was everything in the chat. Do we have any other questions? And actually, uh, I did. Um, oh, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I have a, uh, this is Arthi. I just asked that last question about um, does you know the content have to be related to data? Um, the, the other question I have is um, are you applying for like each toolkit or piece of content or is it kind of like a one application for maybe all the things that you you ha you have that you think could be considered a global good? So it's like individual content pieces. And I'm not sure if our situation applies to others, but I was the example in the chat. We've got a course on managing childhood illnesses and vaccination and first thousand days and that type of thing. So should should I apply for every single like collection of content or just like one that says, you know, here's everything we have. We think everything's considered a global good. Okay, that, that's a great question and, and not one with an easy answer, I think. Um, but but I guess it um, because I guess it also speaks to you know how how it was developed and for whom um, you know is there alignment with um, some of the multilateral agencies and so on. Um, I I would probably say if it's specifically around training materials for health workers, uh, it would probably be best to submit it as one, um, just with a, a wide body, but. As I say, I mean, there could be, you know, d depending I mean, on your sort of discretion, if, if you think that there's, um, you know, a particular component perhaps that is more mature or um, 
uh, more fully developed than others, then you could always submit that as a separate piece. Great, right, thank you. So my question was about um, kind of the, the overall strategy, I guess, and I understand that the G series is really for just recognition and sort of registration of global good. I think you know, one of the challenges that we all face, particularly, um, I would say content people, um, because we're often considered sort of plumbing, um, is sustainability and um, maybe perhaps some integration into the other global goods. So would you say that it's reasonable that, you know, do we hurt ourselves by um, sort of describing that as a need that we're still there with the hope that somewhere in the future, there would be some additional funding to help evolve the global good into something that's either more integrated or more sustainable? Or is this really, do you think that this, the expectation is, is that this is more about uh, awareness and publicity and and feedback to the content. Yeah, so so I think you know we're well aware of the sustainability issues. Um, you know, not not just for content, but but for software applications as well. And you know, while we're looking for you know things that promote sustainability, like you know evidence of multiple funding streams, for example, um, or you know some sort of anchor organisation that that is curating it. Um, you know, we we do recognise that this is this is a difficult area. Um, so, you know, please don't let that um, dissuade you from um, applying. Does, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it, I, it makes sense to be, uh, I mean, first of all, we have to be doing an honest assessment of what we're, where we're at. But I think that there's also a little bit of an aspirational goal to much of the work that we do. And it would be nice to uh, see a long-term plan for being registered as a way to help improve those things, either integration, sustainability, scalability. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think particularly because the, this is the first time that we focus solely on content. I, you know, I think this is going to be a learning process as well for everyone involved. Um, and, you know, hopefully something that we can um, sort of really use to, to strengthen the, the whole domain generally. Linda, maybe you could briefly touch on the benefits of um, the Global Goods Guidebook, like um, who uses it and who's endorsed it and things like that. I feel like that's a pretty big pull at this point. Yeah, thanks, Maria. I, I will do that. Um, but sorry, just be before that, I notice um, Mark has his hand raised. Thank you, Mark Herringer here from healthsites.io. We're publishing a baseline of health facility data with OpenStreetMap which as many of you may know is published data under an ODBL data license. And um, just going back to the point made earlier um, regarding the sustainability of the, of the content, um, you know, what we're finding is very few organizations or ministries of health, let's say ministries of health, because most of the organizations working in country are beholden to the ministry of health. So very few ministries of health have open data policies that support their governance of their master facility list that are consistent with OpenStreetMap. So the status quo for our global good has been that people all use the data, but no one shares back and the data isn't um, integrated into their systems in a, in a way which is consistent with the data license of an open data policy. So, so this is work essentially that needs to come before the this, this sustainability can be achieved, if you know what I mean. So there's a lot of work being done with Transform Health at the moment in, in terms of governance of the data and, and support for open data policies. And I think that that is an essential uh, piece of work that, that would lead to the sustainability. Um, so rather than a question it was more than a, a comment um thank you very much over yeah no and, and thank you very much for all of your input as as i sort of yeah just just would like to reiterate you know um we're aware that many of the sustainability areas might well rank quite low um we we are aware of some of the initiatives sort of underway to to try and enhance that um and we you know have been looking for example at our 
Global Goods Innovators Summit a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, we had a whole day actually dedicated to sustainability and, and different business models or, um, you know, different ways of working that might actually enhance that. Um, so, yeah, but thank you for your point. Okay, so, um, yeah, thanks, Maria. Um, in terms of the, the Global Goods Guidebook, so this is something that is utilised I would say primarily by, um, it's certainly targeted at ministries of health and it is used um, in, you know, many of the um, advocacy activities that PATH and Digital Square are engaged in. Um, so really, you know, providing those sort of digital health leaders and the decision makers with information, you know, to, to really make them firstly aware of because many of Many of the people that we actually talk to are, are not aware of global goods. So part of that is just getting that the message out there and then sort of explaining, you know, why we believe in open source or open license content um, and, you know, how we believe that can really strengthen their systems. Um, the, um, the other audiences are, so, you know, just anyone else actually working within digital health um, collaborators and so on. Um, Maria, did I answer that? Did you ask about something else? No, I think that's a great overview. Thank you. I, I think it's helped add that additional context. Right. Are there any other questions before we start to wrap up? And please keep in mind that if you think of any questions after the fact, we are still accepting them until this Friday emailed to me um, and they will be posted, so. Okay, in that case, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Linda for her excellent question answering and her excellent presentation. And thank you everyone for attending and asking your questions um, and being interested in our process. The uh, slides and recording will be posted on our wiki if you'd like to view it or share it out later. Um, I think that's just about everything. So thank you again so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day wherever in the world you are. And we uh, hope to see you again soon.